Praise the Lord. Good morning, my dear friends. Welcome to Daybreak. Every morning is a gift of God. Let's thank and praise the Lord with this choir. I'm sure the hymn has drawn you closer to God. Now sharpen your ears to listen to today's message. Friends, morning has broken. And let us make this day with a virtue embedded in our hearts. Today, as we continue our Lenten reflection, let us reflect on the theme, Fast from Negative Thinking and Feast on Positive Thinking. Our mind can be very dangerous in its pursuit. It is possible for us to concentrate on negative things and thus go against the very plan and purpose of God in our lives. 
Our mind is very important. That is why in the book of Psalm, chapter 19, verse 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart find favor in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. And so, what is going on in the mind? Is it negative? Is it positive? We must always be vigilant and watchful about what is going on in our minds. That is why in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart, for therein is the source of life. And so, what we think, what we imagine, becomes the source of life for us. That is why Jesus would again stress through his words in the Gospel of Luke, do to others what you would have others do to you. This is chapter 6, verse 31, and he would continue in the verse 37 of the same chapter. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. So what is going on in the mind very, is very important. What is going on in our mind is very important for us because it will set our path. If it is a negative way of thinking, then we are doomed to despair. If it is positive thinking, we are able to bring forth the life. And so we are encouraged to be positive in thinking. That means we are encouraged to be optimistic. We are taught to be seeing the better side of realities rather than sit on a judgment seat. And that is why we have in the letter to the Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 8. Finally, brothers, fill your minds with whatever is truthful, holy, just, pure, lovely, and noble. Be mindful of whatever deserves praise and admiration. And so this is positive way of handling life. And this is again repeated in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 31 to 32, be kind to one another, understanding, forgiving one another, as God forgave you in Christ. And so this is exactly what we reflected a while ago. Do to others what you would like others do to you. And so... St. Paul would continue to insist in the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So then, if you are risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so, thinking positively is a matter of having risen with the Christ, because... In Christ, we are able to look at the brighter side of things because God has made everything beautiful. And that is why St. Paul would continue to write in the letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 16 to 19. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks to God at every moment. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And so, the risen Christ would encourage us during this land to develop 
positive thinking because he thinks well of us. Let this virtue of positive thinking be the one we embed in our hearts today. Let's draw these lessons from the message and put them into practice. Saints are model for us. So let us have a glimpse of the saint of the day. Saint John of Egypt was born in Lycopolis, modern Aswit, Egypt, and spent his youth as a carpenter under his father. Then, feeling a call from God, he left the world and committed himself to a holy solitary in the desert. He was a man who desired to be alone with God and became one of the most famous hermits of his time. For 10 years, he was the disciple of an elderly seasoned hermit. This holy man taught him how to be holy. Saint John called him his spiritual father. After the older monk's death, Saint John spent a few years in various monasteries because he wanted to know how monks pray and live. Finally, John found a cave high in the rocks. The area was quiet and protected from the desert sun and winds. He divided the cave into three parts, a living room, a workroom, and a little chapel. He then walled himself up with a single window opening to preach to the people who came to see him and seek his advice about important matters. Even Emperor Theodosius I asked his advice twice. People in the area bought him food and other necessities. When so many people came to visit him, some men became his disciples. They stayed in the area and built a hospice. They took care of the hospice so that more people could come to benefit from the wisdom of this hermit. Such well-known saints as Augustine and Jerome wrote about the holiness of him. St. John was able to prophesy future events. He could look into the souls of those who came to him. He could read their thoughts. When he applied blessed oil on those who had a physical illness, they were often cured. Even when John became famous, he remained humble and did not lead an easy life. He never ate before sunset. When he did eat, his food was dried fruit and vegetables. He never ate meat or cooked or warm food. Saint John knew that his life of self-sacrifice would help him stay close to God. He died peacefully in 394 at the age of 90. The three last days of his life, John gave wholly to God. On the third, he was found on his knees as if in prayer, but his soul was with the blessed. Let us pray. Saint John, though you wanted to be alone, you advised many men on many matters of spiritual life. Pray that we may follow God's will for our lives, even when it is difficult for us. St. John, you healed the sick and prayed for sinners. Intercede for us in all our ills of body and soul and help us draw closer to God. Amen. St. John of Egypt, pray for us. After having listened to the saint, let us resolve to lead a saintly life. Word of God is the food for our soul. So let us prepare our hearts for today's daily bread. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, welcome to the daily bread, the daily reflection on the word of God. During this Lenten season, we are reflecting on the Bible passages prescribed by the Latin liturgy for every day. And today we are presented with the gospel according to Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 to 19. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
but he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, dear friends. We are in the Lenten season, a time of soul-searching, self-examination of conscience, examining how our relations are with God, with our neighbor, with oneself, and how we are related, how we are in our religious life. We are all children of God, created by God, and made children through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. We are given also the sacraments to nourish us and the law of love to make us really live as children. Now, today's reading is giving a norm, a criterion. And the criterion, it seems, is very, very important. And Jesus is giving this contrast. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a kind of understanding that the Old Testament is already old and outdated, doesn't have any value anymore. What is important is only that of Jesus Christ. It is only partially true. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the old, I, come, I have come to fulfill. Fulfilling and abolishing are two different things. So fulfilling is taking further, leading the testament, leading the commandments to its goal. Now Jesus gives a, makes a contrast between the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes and that what he teaches. The Pharisees we know were people who were dedicated, who had dedicated themselves to the strict observance of the law. This movement originated during the persecution of Antiochus IV and the Maccabean revolt around year 167 to 164 BC. They made it a point to observe the law with all its rigor, whatever may happen to them. And Antiochus had forbidden, forbidden them to circumcise, to observe Sabbath and all the laws. And these people said, no, we will obey, even giving our lives. And people were killed for their life, for their obedience. But later on it came, the Pharisaic movement, they became well known for their fidelity to the law, the observers of the law. They called themselves the Hasidim, the holy ones. And because of their dress, different from others, they were called Perushim, who were separated ones. But one thing important for them, they were aware that they are holy people. They obeyed the law. And how did they obey? Meticulously, everything to the letter. That's important, not that word, to the letter. They were literally observing. For example, they just said, you shall keep the Sabbath. Don't do any hard work. Observe the Sabbath. And they made it a point to observe the Sabbath so dutifully that they made a list of about 39 or 40 types of works that are forbidden. So they said, this is not done, this should be done, you should not wash your feet, your hands, you should not cook the food, and you should not carry a burden, don't do any treatment of the sick, etc. So the attention became so negative that you should not do that and you should not do that. And what is the purpose of the Sabbath? The Sabbath was given as a law to give rest to the people who work. You shall work six days, but the seventh day you shall rest. Because remember, you were slaves in Egypt, and you had to work 24 hours, seven days a week. And now you are the people of God, and you should rest, and you should allow people to rest. Sabbath, the importance of Sabbath is to rest, and the rest is to be in the presence of God. So instead of resting, they made it a point not to work. That's how the Old Testament, the law was considered literally. And now comes Jesus, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, whatever. The law was intended for. That's what Jesus is doing. So the Sabbath and whatever. And see what is the most important law. A scribe came to ask Jesus to put him to test, ask him the question, what is the most important law? Everybody knew that. They were saying it every day, so many times. Shema Israel, Shema Israel, El Yahweh Elohenu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. So everybody knows that. And now Jesus tells also, 
love your neighbor as yourself. So this is where Jesus goes beyond the written law. This is where Jesus goes to the spirit, the heart. And they were, had forbidden healing practice of, the, of a physician on the day of Sabbath. Only so much treatment should be given as to keep the life going. A person keep from dying and the next day you can get the treatment. But Jesus was healing everybody. And he said, Sabbath is for men, for people, not people for Sabbath. God has given the law for you to be free, to be happy, to enjoy in the presence of God. Don't make people slaves of law. That's what Jesus was telling. And this is the attitude. Not that he's breaking the law, but he's fulfilling the law. And this is what we should also ask. How is our relation to our religious duties and obligations? Some people find it difficult to go every Sunday to Mass. Now we have seven days, 24 hours work. Sundays will be open, it is said. And you become a slave of work and you make others also ens enslaved. So this is the time to reflect. How is my religious responsibility? Don't become a Pharisee who thought literally observing the law, you become a holy one. Jesus is going to the spirit. And the law is the most important law is the law of love. Law of love, law of compassion. Love your God with all your heart. And this love should be manifested by the service you do to your neighbors in need. So love of God, love of neighbor. This is the way Jesus is fulfilling the law. And that's how we are asked to also. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great covenant you have made us, made with us through Jesus Christ by his blood. And the only law of the covenant is that of love. You loved us so much that you gave you your only son, that we may have life. Enable, Father, to love you and our neighbors as you have loved us. This prayer we make through Christ our Lord, the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure today's Daily Bread has given you a new insight to the scriptures that you have listened. As we come to the end of this episode, let us once again thank and praise our God with this hymn. to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my God Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way Make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. He will lead me Rivers in the desert will I see Heaven and earth will fade But His word will still remain And He will do something new today God will make a way That there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my God Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way
My dear friends, I really hope the last half an hour has certainly been a blessing to you. Until we meet, stay blessed.